Blessed be Yahweh, King of the universe, has sanctified us by his commands, redeemed us by the blood of his Son, and given us command to hear and respond to the call of the children. to the soul of man whenever they die. And actually, if you look at the translation there, it just means being. It's, it's who you are and what you've become when Yahweh placed His Spirit in us. And so, um, uh, the half Torah portions this week are in Ezekiel chapter 37. And one of the resurrections is described for us there, so it, it brought forth the perfect opportunity to present a teaching that we can put on the internet because I can't answer every. I'm getting so many questions that I, I can't make the phone calls and talk to everybody for a couple of hours, so I'm going to take the opportunity today to bring forth what Yahweh has shown me concerning the two resurrections of the dead. Um, some rabbis, um, even some Christian scholars claim it could be up to seven resurrections, but I know biblically, scripturally, we can prove that there are two, and there's a reason that there is at least two resurrections. Because we know, hallelujah, there's my mother. <laughs> Mom, there's a chair over here for you. So if we, if we stay biblically dialed in and we use the scriptures to prove whatever it is we believe, then I believe that we can use that, uh, or I can use it as a teacher to present to the body of believers because that's what every patriarch, every apostle did in their teaching. They used the word and the works of Yahshua to prove every last thing that they taught doctrine. And so we're going to take that opportunity today. So those of you who brought your scriptures, 
Um, can read along with us, and we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you that didn't, you can read along anyway on the PowerPoint. But we will begin with these opening verses, and I always like to use the, the Brit Hadashah, our New Testament, because if you, if you start there, most of the people that are maybe just coming out of churchanity and starting to see what we're doing, they can, they can better grasp what we're teaching if we start the New Testament and go back. Instead of starting at the beginning and going forward, we got to kind of uh, deprogram some of the ways that we've been taught to think concerning the law and the prophets. So we'll begin in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanks thanksgiving be made for all men, for sovereigns, and for all those who are in authority, in order that we lead a calm and peaceable life in reverence and seriousness. That word is, I mean, this is a serious thing for us to understand. And so the proper understanding concerning what happens to us when we, if we're not alive at Yahshua's coming, we need to know what to expect when our eyes open during the resurrection. We need to know where we're at and what our role is as a wife, as the bride of Messiah. It's, it's very serious and crucial for us to understand these things. For this is good and acceptable before Elohim, our Savior. Continuing verse 4, who desires all men to be saved. Now that, this word is where we get in trouble in English. Saved, salvation, these, these concepts that we see. Salvation, I taught, was you say this prayer, brother, you're going to the kingdom. But actually, when we look at the Exodus, everybody that came out of the world or Egypt was saved, but they didn't go directly into the kingdom. They went to the mountain. There was a covenant. There was a ketubah. There was a lot of things that led up to them actually going into the kingdom. But one was them roaming around for 40 years in the wilderness because of their what? Disobedience. So we don't just die and go into the kingdom. It's very clear. Scripture. And this is what we're going to be studying today using the uh, half Torah portions to do so. Who desires all men to be saved. Yahweh desires all of us to enter into the millennial reign that his son is going to come back for and to receive the bride. He wants us to be there. So he's made every opportunity. He's opened every possible door that he could for us to make it. He loves us. He wants us to be saved. And I mean not redeemed. Because the blood of Messiah has redeemed the whole world of its sin. He's talking about I want you to come in to my protection, my covering. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that seed, notice that the knowledge of the truth has something to do with his definition of being saved. <laughs> so we're going to go at and we're going to we're going to see what truth is because he wants us to be walking in the truth. For there is one Elohim and one mediator between Elohim and men, the man Messiah Yahshua, who gave himself a ransom for all to be witnessed in its own season. Now in most English versions, you're seeing in due season there. And, but if you look at that Greek word, it's actually this Hebrew word. Moed. The Moedim. So here we see that the salvation that Yahweh's talking about here and the truth has something to do with this, his feast. It has something to do with his feast. First we'll look at this word seasons, and then we'll come back and, and see what the biblical, de one of, there's many, uh, we'll look at the, uh, one of the biblical definitions of the word truth, because he wants us to walk in it. And if we're walking in the truth, then we're walking in Messiah. So seasons there is the Strong's Greek word 2540. This is the same Greek word used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Torah. Now, this is where you can begin to prove certain doctrines and misconceptions about the doctrine of New Testament teaching. Here's one, one example. We have a book that everybody, uh, Brother Larry just got his, but I suggest that everybody gets these books so you can study the language as well. 
But there's a book called the Apostolic Bible Polyglot, and you can go to the Greek Torah, and it's coded with the Strong's numbers. So all of the Greek words you can match to the Greek New Testament words and see if you're staying doctrinally sound, and that's what we've done here. This is the same Greek word used in the Septuagint in Genesis 1.14, where Yahweh talks about the days, months, and seasons, the moon and the sun being that which he gave us, to keep track of time. And his Moedim is the seasons that he's talking about here. So it's the same Greek word in the Torah and in the New Testament. So that means that it's this Hebrew word. Moedim. So in the New Testament, this apostle or emissary was saying that we need to know the truth. Because it's Yahweh's desire that we be saved in the truth, in the true way of being saved, and it has something to do with the Moedim. You see, there's a little different picture we receive when we start studying that Hebrew there. This has got something to do with the Moedim, it's got something to do with biblical truth, because it's Yahweh's desire that we use those tools to be saved and come into his kingdom. So the foundation of the study, we see uh, in these opening verses that Shaul says we are to pray, be thankful, respect those in authority over us, support in intercession, which is very important that we intercede for one another in prayer. Like over this building we have, do you understand how big this is? It's a little run-down shack. Comes with some property. But as I began to work on this place and other brothers came and began to participate, I seen the unity of people coming together in this community, finally, after years, and participating in erecting a building that will bear his name. And when I seen all of the things that needed to be done, I began to, to weep and to, and to pray and to cry out for everybody to come together so that we can make this happen. And I looked at this tattered little building, and I pictured myself when I came to him. But he has made something beautiful inside of each and every one of us out of beaten up and battered buildings. First, Brother Bob repaired the roof, the covering. Brother Harley comes in and he starts coming up with all these ideas. He brings the wood. Our father is a carpenter. Brother Larry, everybody's getting involved. And that shows Yahweh who is willing to come together in unity in order to make a dwelling place for his name. We know that he dwells in us and we're his temple. But you better bet, I don't know of any other place in the state of Idaho that's going to have his name in Hebrew on Main Street. Hallelujah. So, moving on here. Most importantly, we are told in these verses that it is Yahweh's will that all be saved. And this, this is where the doctrines of the resurrections are very important for us to understand so that we can see what he's went through to make sure that there is an opportunity all the way to the very end. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of repentance. He, does, he loves us. He doesn't want anybody to be lost, but we know by the prophecies, and especially in the book of Revelation, that there's going to be people that deny him right up to the very end and that their part is in the lake of fire. So, not everybody's just going to grab onto it and run with it like we have. We need to intercede for those people and continue to pray to the very end. Hallelujah. And come to the knowledge of the truth in his Torah. We can be sure, as we will learn in this study, that he has indeed given opportunity for just that because of his great love for his creation. This is the purpose of the resurrections. Now, let's go back and lay the foundation here. For the truth. What is the truth? What is biblical truth? No, I mean, we can, we can understand what not telling a lie, you're being truthful. But let's see what Yahweh says the truth is. Let's go to Psalms 119. To Hillel.
We'll be reading verses 140 through 165. Your word is tried exceedingly, and your servant has loved it. I am small and despised. I have not forgotten your orders. Your righteousness is righteousness forever. And your what? Torah is true. Now, knowing that the men who wrote those verses <coughs> that we just read, Shaul or Paul, that is the definition he had in mind when he wrote that. And many of you are seeing the law there. Your law is true. The law is, is actually better translated as Torah because that's what it's speaking of many times. Your Torah is true. Verse 143, distress and anguish have found me. Your commands are my delight. The righteousness of your witnesses is forever. Make me understand that I might live. See that? It was his desire that we be saved. And he's saying that the foundation of the truth will do what? Make me understand that I may live. It will give you life. This is the same biblical teaching. We covered a couple. I have called with all my heart. It has something to do with the heart. There, See that, that thing that um, we're taught in the church? Well, now it's a thing of the heart. No, it's always been a thing of the heart. You're always looking for his Torah to be on it. That's a cleansed heart when his laws are present in your heart. I have called with all my heart. Answer me, O Yahweh. I observe your laws. I have called upon you. Save me that I might guard your witness. See that? Save me. Guard me with your witnesses. The Torah is true. So these are the definitions that he was speaking of when he wrote that because there was no New Testament until approximately 396 of the Common Era. I rise before dawn and cry for help. And this rising thing is something that we're going to be studying here. And many times it's the same Hebrew word, kum. My eyes have gone before the night watches to study your word. Hear my voice according to your kindness. O Yahweh, revive me according to your right ruling. Those who pursue mischief have drawn near. They have been far from your Torah. See that? The people who aren't walking in truth are people who aren't walking in the Torah. You are near, O Yahweh, and all of your commands are what? Truth. So this, this is what this apostle would have been speaking of. These definitions, that truth. So in order to be walking in the truth, we need to be practicing the Torah commands. Of old I have known your witness, that you have found them forever. See my affliction and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your Torah. Plead my cause and redeem me. It's got something to do with redemption. What is his will? All men to be saved. Redeemed. This is... This is, is a teaching right out of the Tanakh that we're reading about there. Right out of the Tanakh. Verse 155, deliverance is far from me, wrong ones, for they have not sought your laws. See, you're in, you're in error if you're not seeking his laws, according to these writings. Your compassions are many, O Yahweh, revive me according to your right rulings. My persecutors and adversaries are many, I have not turned aside from your witness. I saw traitors and was grieved because they did not guard your word. See how I have loved your orders, Yahweh. Revive me according to your kindness. The sum of your word is true. That word sum means all of it. And there was no New Testament when this was being written. The sum of the word that he's speaking of here is the Tanakh, the Law and the Prophets, the, the uh, writings in Psalms and, and so on and so forth. Jump down to 160, starting there again. The sum of your word is truth, and your righteous right rulings are forever. Rulers have persecuted me without cause, but your word... My heart stood in awe. I rejoiced at your word as one who finds great treasure, and I have hated falsehood. See that? And loathe it, your Torah I have loved. 
I have praised you seven times a day because of your righteous right rulings. Great peace have those loving your Torah. Really? That we may lead a peaceable life. You see where he's getting all of these biblical concepts? It's from the Tanakh. And he states, the writer of this psalm states over and over that his commandments and his Torah are true. Now these are the definitions that Shaul would have been thinking of when he wrote that. So that gives us a little uh, biblical principle to, go, to build on as we lead uh, further into the study. Great peace have those loving your Torah, and for them there is no stumbling block. If you have his laws in your heart, you won't stumble. If you're focused on being obedient to him, your life will you'll lead, lead a life. We're not going to be problemless in our life. But if we lead a life according to Torah and seek his judgments and precepts, then what we're going to get in the end is a life of peace. Because we will be tested while we're in this flesh. No doubt about it. Okay, moving on. Now we'll all read the portions. These are the half Torah portions in Ezekiel 37, verses 15 through uh, 28. Okay, beginning at verse 15. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, And you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Yehuda and for the children of Yisrael, his companions. Take another stick and write for Yosef, the stick of Ephraim, and for all of the house of Israel, his companions. Then bring together for yourself into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. So here we see a symbol of regathering, the sticks. So we're going to do a study on that word stick here in a moment. We'll better understand what he's trying to say. Verse 18. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Won't you show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus saith the Master Yahweh, See, I am taking the stick of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I shall give them unto him with the stick of Yehuda, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write shall be in your hand before their eyes, and speak to them, Thus saith the Master Yahweh. See, I am taking the children of Israel from a, where among the Gentiles, wherever they have gone, and shall gather them from all around. Now, has Yahshua came back and brought Israel to the land yet? No. So this is a prophecy that's in action right now. We are Israel. But we're not in the land yet. He's going to give it to us. It's ours. So this kind of gives us a time frame to look at here. It says that they're going to be gathered out of the Gentiles. Now remember, the reason why he casted the northern ten tribes out of Israel is because of their disobedience, not using the name, worshiping other mighty ones, amongst many other things. They're cast out into the nations, and he said that when he comes back, he's going to regather them. So, that actually hasn't happened yet, so that little spot on the map over there everybody's paying attention to is not Israel. Israel's sitting in this room. <laughs> it's in the process of coming to pass. But this, this, we'll, we'll get a huge answer to this whole thing 
when we begin to study the resurrections herself and these sticks he's talking about here. And this is comforting to know that people don't just, this is it. There's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than just somebody throwing my body six foot under the ground, throwing dirt on top of me, and I'm either going to heaven or hell. Yahweh wants us to be saved. He has given us opportunity after opportunity, not only in this life as we're going to see, all the way up to the very end, his door is open. That's the type of mighty one I serve. He's righteous, he's loving, and he gives us plenty of chances to come home. That's the type of father I want in my life. I really don't think it would be a loving Elohim if he said, you know what, all your life, you have the opportunity, when you die, you're done. It's over. Think about it. Verse 22, and I shall make them one nation, so that means Yehuda and Israel will be one again. That's the whole thing about the sticks. <clears throat> It should be one nation in the land. That has not happened yet. Israel and Judah dwelling together as brothers in the land is not happening right now. On the mountains of Israel, and one sovereign shall be sovereign over them, Yahshua, and let, and let them no longer be two nations, and let them no longer divide into two regions. Go ahead and stop right there. <clears throat> now, this is where it gets good. These two sticks, <clears throat> that word, English word stick is kind of not very clear. But in verse 16, the word stick is the strong Hebrew number 6086, and it's eights or ets in Hebrew. In the ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon by uh, Binner, <clears throat> it's number 1363A subsection N. Now everybody get your little paper there. I want you to look at these pictures. Now remember, all of, all I, I can sit here and count on, on, I can't even count them all on two hands. All of the different doctrines that I have read throughout my lifetime about these sticks. What it means, who they are, what part of the world they're in, and everything else. But let's look at the picture. All right. So here we have the iron. The ancient Hebrew hieroglyphic for ayin is the... <coughs> oh, look, it's an eye. <laughs> that will be the second one down on your sheets on the right-hand column. Notice it says that um, its picture is an eye. It means to watch, know, or shade. Now, this is the zari. And it's the fourth one down. It takes a little different, uh, it looks a little different. It doesn't have the head on the end. It's got a line instead. But that's a man on his side. Now what we're seeing here is Yahweh watching someone resting. See that? This is, this is also in the verses where Jacob laid down and put the, his head on the stone. That is also used there. What was he doing? He was laying down resting. That's when he received what? The revelation of Yahweh. And that's when he wrestled with Yahweh. So this is showing us that Yahweh's watching over those in rest. Now, think of all these different concepts we see in the New Testament. Those who sleep in the Messiah. All of these different concepts come to your mind. Now, it's got something to do with a tree. In the ancient Hebrew, this definition of people, him watching people resting, has to do with a tree. Remember, there was two trees in the garden, wasn't there? This story goes back to the beginning. It means a tree, <clears throat> or the wood from a tree, and its root 
in this definition is in subsection A. Concretely, it means tree. So what we're dealing with here in this prophecy is he's saying that Israel and Judah will become one tree again. One tree. The upright and firmness of the tree... The elk, now this is a this is a, bit, a biblical definition, concrete definition, right out of Binner's lexicon. The elders of the tribe were the upright and firm ones making decisions and giving advice. People that are up here doing what I'm doing are supposed to be adding people to the family tree. This tree has broken branches. Those branches are going to be engrafted back into the tree. And that's a New Testament teaching we're going to get into. So actually we're seeing here the word tree is going to make one tree. So where does the word tree lead us in scripture? Jeremiah chapter 11 verses 15 through 16. Why should my beloved be in my house? He's talking about those who said I do at Mount Sinai. She has done wickedness. What man would let his wife lie around and let her come back in his home and sleep next to him defiled? She has done wickedness with many. And does the set-apart flesh remove you from your evil? He said, I sanctified you. That's the, the prayer that most Hebrew people say. Um, you have sanctified us by your commands. He sanctified us and set us apart as a people. And the people defiled themselves with other men, other mighty ones. He says, why should I let them stay in my house? There's no reason. And does the set-apart flesh remove your evil from you? He said, you know what, I can sanctify your flesh, but unless your heart is set on serving me and loving me and me alone, you're being set, set apart in the flesh as Israel does me no good. You're not honoring me as my people if you are doing wickedness with many others. Yahweh has named you green olive tree. They had goodly fruit. With the noise of a great sound, he has set on fire, and its branches shall be broken. Could somebody turn off these two lights back there, please? It's one of those switches, these two. <clears throat> With the noise of a great sound, he has set on fire, and its branches shall be broken. Okay. And I submit to you that this is why there is more than one resurrection. Because there's broken branches that have been cast out into the nations. Now let's read uh, Jeremiah chapter 12. Verses 14 through 17. Thus said Yahweh, As for all the evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, see, I am plucking them out of their land. And I shall pluck out the house of Yehuda from their midst. And it shall be, after my plucking them out, I shall return. He hasn't done that yet. And have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his inheritance and everyone to his land. And it shall be, if they learn well the ways of my people, the Torah we just read about and the commands that we just read about that leads us into life. To swear by my name as Yahweh lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal which is translated, we all know, then they shall be established in the midst of my people 
but if they do not obey. So here we see the people that are going to be coming in to the nation of Israel must also follow the commands and call upon his name. That's not a New Testament teaching. That's where Shaul got this from, is this prophecy. Then they shall be established in the midst of my people, but if they do not obey, I pluck up, pluck up and destroy that nation, declares Yahweh. So here we see that it's not only a stipulation for Israel and Judah, but all of those Gentiles who choose to sojourn with them. And we don't see that in church entity. That stuff was nailed to the cross. All right. Okay. So where does this planting, plucking, and harvesting begin on this particular topic? Psalms 80, verse 7 and 8. Turn us back, O Elohim of hosts, and cause your face to shine, that we what? Might be saved. You brought a vine out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, and you drove out the nations and planted it. Now, this is significant for us to understand here. This Hebrew word vine, it means to bend concretely a grape vine. The vines of a grape, or excuse me, the vines of the grapevine are twisted and bent as it winds around a pole. Yahshua was the branch of Jesse, and he was nailed to a what? A pole. Now look at your sheet there, and look at the ancient Hebrew letters there. That's the Gimel. That's the Gimel, the Pei, and the Nun. Now look at the Gimel. It's the third one down in the left column. It means foot. Foot has to do with your walk. It means to gather or walk. Now the word pay is the third one down on the right-hand column. And it, uh, the, it's a picture of the mouth. And it means to blow or scatter. There it is. And in the noon, of course, is a sea. So in the, in the ancient Hebrew writings for the word vine, we see that they would be gathered because they've been scattered. Gathering of the scattered seed. That's not a New Testament teaching. He had already told them that he was going to scatter them because of their disobedience. And as we're going to see as we study, uh, continue into the study of the resurrections here, that it's got everything to do with the seed being gathered and disobedience in the New Testament teachings as well. So here we see that this begins to take on a whole lot deeper substance when we begin to understand that even this salvation then had something to do with gathering the scattered seed. That's what the resurrections are for. And there's two separate groups of people as we're going to see. All right. Romans chapter 11, verse 15 through 19. For if they're casting away, he's speaking of Israel. If they're casting away is the restoration to favor of the world, what is their acceptance but life from the dead? Speaking about a resurrection here. Now if the first root is set apart, the lump is also. And if the root is set apart, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, we just seen it in the prophecy. So the branches were broken off, just like the prophecy said, and the branches will be regathered in the same way the prophecy said. We're being taught in churchanity that we come up and say a prayer, and we're those branches being grafted back into the tree, which contradicts this prophecy. He hasn't came back yet. <laughs> okay, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree... Now we're starting to get into the understanding here about who Israel is. When a branch was taken off the tree and cast out into the nations, it had fruit on the branch, correct? What happens to a branch when it's separated from the tree? It dies. 
What happens to the fruit that's on the tree? It dies. Where does it go? Back into the ground. When it rains, the dew, Yahshua comes, it waters that seed, and it jumps up as wild shoots all over the land. We are the wild olive tree. The branches were broken off. That seed died when he scattered it out into the nations. The watering, the washing of the water by the word has came, Yahshua. And now the seed is beginning to pop up all over in the nations of the world. The wild olive tree. Yahshua was the vine who was brought out of Egypt because he was in the loins of the people who came out of Egypt. And he transplanted him into the land. Then he put it, got put on a pole so that he could begin to regather the scattered seed. When Yahshua is the vine, he's on the pole, what did they do? Instead of breaking his legs, they cut him. When you take grapevines and you begin to engraft, it has to be done at a certain point of the season. If you go to cut a branch off of a, a crop and you go to split them and twine them during the wrong time of the year, they're both going to die. But at the appointed time, Yahshua came, just like we've learned in the prophecies, and he was split. That vine was split and we were engrafted back into the olive tree. If that engrafting would have tried to be done in any other time than during the Moedim in which it was set forth in prophecy, it would have never worked. Both branches would have died. Both trees, Israel and Judah. They would have died. We would have died. It had to be done at the appointed time that the Father has given. The wild olive tree have been grafted in among them and became to share in the root and the fatness of the original olive tree. Do you see what we're seeing here? We are being taught in churchianity on a daily basis, or every Sunday, not to be connected to the tree. There's some false teachings going on there that has us want to stay apart from those people who killed the Messiah and were not being able to be engrafted into the tree. When every prophecy, and even in the New Testament, it says that we've got to be joined to the tree to be saved. And in that tree is a doctrine, and the doctrine, or the, uh, uh, what do we have as a nation? Isn't there a group of laws that we go by? What do they call it? The Constitution? The Constitution of Israel is Torah. So you know that that nation over there that they call Israel right now, that the Torah is not their constitution. When they were given that land by Britain, if they would have said, hey, what is your government going to be? And they said, Torah, then we would have known, hey, that's Israel. We're being regathered. But it's not. They have their own governing rules. So that can't be Israel, according to prophecy. Now we're getting somewhere. Do not boast against the branches. And if you do boast, remember, you do not bear the root, but the root bears you. You shall say that the branches were broken off. I was talking about the prophecy back there. Those branches were broken off so that what? We might be grafted in. Good. By unbelief, what kept them from going into the kingdom? Unbelief. Now, now this gets better. Well, I get excited. Sorry. <laughs> by unbelief they were broken off and you stand by belief and many of you are seeing faith in your scripture but it doesn't mean faith is this word that makes you think oh it's this hope and this, this uh, emotional thing that I feel no it means a belief system it's a belief system it's what I believe and if I walk like Yahshua walked it's going to show everybody that I believe in the doctrine of Israel therefore I'm connected to the tree of Israel which is the olive tree. 
By unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by belief. Do not be arrogant, but fear. And he goes on to say, because if he did not spare the natural branches, he might not spare us either. We should be humbled by his grace. We should be humbled by it. He's given us so many opportunities to get into this tree. How about Zacchaeus? He was a man of Judah. He was a Jew. But he had been a tax collector and not walking right. And when Messiah come, he was of small stature. So what does he do? He runs. So here we have a man of Judah. He runs and jumps into a what? Showing us that Israel and Judah are being grafted back into the tree. Had nothing to do with him being short. Yahweh was showing us that the regathering was being started. A man of Judah jumped into a tree. Really? Got everything to do with promise. Where they were at. Where the tree was. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Being grafted back into the tree even though he was a sinner. Even though he was unclean. A Gentile in their eyes. Because we're, the nation that you're living in is who you are according to Yahweh. And that's why he sent them out there to begin with. Because they would not love just him. I have committed many sins against him. Forms of adultery. But he loves us, man. He's given us opportunity. The land is ours. It's, it belongs to us. We need to say, Father, I want it. I want it. It's mine. It belongs to me. I'm not being boastful, but give it to me. Whatever I have to do, you've went through every... Uh, uh, you, you've opened so many doors that if I don't step through one of them, I am a coward. And I am not showing respect for the life that your son lived for me and died for me. Hallelujah. We need to praise him and thank him for it. So, so I, I wanted to kind of touch on all this so you guys would understand um, that the teachings of the resurrection and the purposes of the resurrections are throughout the scripture all over the place. If you know or if you've been taught what the, rec what the representation of the resurrections are. Why are there two? And if, and if there was just one, why would there have to be a rapture? Why would there have to be these certain things that we've been taught? Because if you die and go to heaven or hell, and if you indeed have an immortal soul, and we don't. There's some literature up here on that you guys can have. Um, if your soul is immortal and it goes to heaven or hell, then how can the soul die, the soul that sinned, die? That's a prophecy in Ezekiel as well. So we're going to answer, I want to try to answer some of these questions before we get into the biblical teaching of the resurrections. So what we have covered so far in the reading of the portions we see through the prophet uh, Gehetzko, which is Ezekiel, Yahweh declares that after Israel and Yehuda were scattered into the nations as broken branches, they would be gathered together once again as one tree. And this and this. Represents everything that happened in the Exodus. Not only Israelites by blood came out of the Exodus. We had mixed multitudes of people. They said, hey, their mighty one is setting us free and I'm riding with them. I've seen the mighty works and I believe in him. I'm going with them. They chose to leave behind everything that they had known and they went with them out of the land of Goshen. We then see the prophecy begin to come to pass by what Shaul writes to the assembly in Rome. Thus, we are scripturally sound from the Tanakh to the Brit Shah, which is from the Old Testament to the New. Now we can get into this, what we've just read in the half Torah portions. Let's go back to the beginning of the chapter there, and we'll see what he's talking about. It's the first resurrection. <coughs> Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and took me out by the Spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley. Now remember, there's many valleys speaking of, spoken of in Scripture, that, which is now the Kidron Valley, Valley of Jehoshaphat. Many times you'll see it used as different, but it's a place outside the camp where there's a lot of death that's taken place. That's one possibility. Okay, and it was filled with bones. And he made me pass among them all around. Now notice here we have a prophet coming into an area where there were 
bones, dead. Showing us that Yahweh, if, if we want to live, we need to listen to the prophets. Watch what happens. If we listen to what the prophet said that Yahweh told him to say, and if the prophet is indeed speaking only what Yahweh says, then it gives life. And he made me pass among them all around, and see, there was very many on the surface of the valley. And see, they were very dry. When you don't water a vine, you don't water an olive tree. When you don't prune the branches, if it doesn't receive water, it dies. Hallelujah. They were very dry. And he said unto me, and this is what Yahweh asks us, do you want to live or do you want to die? I've sent my prophets to you for years. Okay? If you'll listen to my word that I spoke through them to you, you'll live. And that's what this whole thing is about. Son of man, would these bones live? And I said, he said, I don't have that answer. And I stand before you as a man of Yahweh today and say, I can't make you live. But if you'll listen to me tell you what Yahweh said, or if any man of Yahweh in this room tells his family, this is what Yahweh said. This is what Yahuwah said. You understand where I'm coming from here? If you pass on his word, it will give life to the rest of your family. These dry bones. <laughs> oh, Father. Good thing Yahshua is the water that we need. We're going to see that in a moment. And he said to me, Son of man, would these bones live? And I said, Oh, Master, I can't tell, but you can. Share this information with me so that I can pass it on to these dry bones. Because they're definitely dead. <laughs> Continuing in verse 4, again he said to me, prophesy to the bones. See that? The dead were going to live by prophecy. Everything has to do with the prophecies made. This is the only way that we can live in the end, is if we listen to the voice of the prophet. And you say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Now, if he's prophesying to dead bones of Israel, don't you think they all would have heard the Torah at some point in their life? <coughs> but had they received the living word? This would be the Hebrew word Debar. And I submit to you that he's talking about the Logos. In Greek, Yeshua, the word. Yeshua is the Debar of Yahweh. So they had heard the Torah, many of these bones in this valley, but had they received Yahshua? Hear the word of Yahweh. Now there's a reason why he's having them prophesy in this marriage we're going to see. Thus said the Master Yahweh to the bones, See, I am bringing into you a spirit, so does that, does that mean that your spirit is yours? Where is it going to go when you die? It goes back to the one who gave it to you. And he's going to give you another opportunity. He's going to give it to you again. It's not yours. It's only yours right now because it's a gift to you from him. It's his breath. It's the gift of life. See, I am bringing into you a spirit and you shall live. And I shall put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put a spirit in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. This is a resurrection in the flesh, guys. So can this be the resurrection that is spoken about in the New Testament when Yahshua comes back and we receive a glorified body? Nope. This is a resurrection in the flesh. This is a resurrection of people who have not received the word, the living word, Yahshua. Yet. Now this should give us peace to know that we have loved ones in our lives that may have died without receiving Yahshua, the Word. They're going to rise again and they are going to be given an opportunity to live. Yahshua shows us that when He's standing 
at the gates and people were coming to him. He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And that word knew is the same word that is used in the Hebrew where Adam knew Eve, his wife. He said, you were intimate with me. You didn't follow my commands. You didn't follow my father's Torah. So depart from me, you workers of iniquity, lawlessness. Right? He didn't send people to Gehenna right there. He, said, he didn't say go burn in hell. He said, you're just not ready to come in this kingdom yet. Until you go through this, you admit that I am the Mashiach of Israel, and you follow my father's commandments, you're not ready to go into the kingdom. And that's what he's doing. It's the same thing with these who rise. This is the second resurrection. Remember it says the first will be last and the last will be first. This is what they were talking about. And then they will know that, that Yahweh is their Elohim. 1 Corinthians 15.50 will start to lay the foundation of where we're going with all of this. Um, you guys want to turn there? And this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim. Uh-oh. So we have a resurrection in the flesh, and Shaul says that no flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom reign. We're going to see why. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. I submit to you that until you receive Yahshua, you live in corrupt flesh. Oh, dry bones, hear the word, Yahshua. Remember the woman at the well? Yahshua was talking to the bride. <laughs> One drop of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. You'll never have dry bones. <clears throat> if you drink of the water that I give you, you will live forever. And she said, give me this water. You'll get it. And then he tells her of things that she had not revealed to him about her life, and she knew that that was Yahweh. Understand this? That's resurrection of prophecy. So here we see that this is a resurrection in the flesh. And we see that Paul teaches that if you if flesh and blood can inherit this kingdom reign. Further in uh, Ezekiel 37, and I prophesied as he commanded me. See that? If a prophet tells you. Only what Yahweh has told him to tell you, then you will live if you follow what Yahweh has said to do. In the process that he said to do it. And the Spirit came into them and they lived. That hasn't happened yet. And stood upon their feet, a very great army. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the house of what? Israel. This is the people that have died out in the nations, that wild fruit that pops up and dies again, goes into the earth and it pops up and, and dies again. And, and it's just, just been creating this fruit for thousands of years. And people ask me all the time, Teddy, what group of people in, in the world is Israel? Good luck. Good luck with that. He told Abraham that, uh, that his seed would be as numerable as the sands of the sea. Try to count that. Son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. See, they say our bones are dry. Our expectancy, many of you are seeing hope in most English versions there. It has to do, that Hebrew word has to do with hoping and accord. Wait a minute. Accord and expectancy. This has to do with something about being birthed. The umbilical cord and expectancy. That's what we see in the Hebrew here. They, Israel, will rise in this resurrection, and this is what they're going to say. Our bones are dry. 
our expectancy, our birth, has perished. Because they're going to wake up and they're going to see we're not in the land. What do we do? For no flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what we see in most things, but it doesn't mean heaven. It means here. The kingdom reign here. And we ourselves have been cut off. Remember the prophecy? And you will be cut off. Those branches will be cut off. And they're going to realize that they have been cut off. But then they're going to also realize what they need to do to get back into the rain because they're going to know the Torah. They're going to know the law of the prophets. They're going to know what to do. Therefore prophecy, and you shall say to them, thus saith the Master Yahweh, See, O my people, I am opening your graves. And that would be Sheol. I am opening Sheol. And shall bring you up from Sheol. And shall bring you into the land of Israel. See, these are people that are going to be resurrected out here in the nations. The resurrection is going to be in the flesh. And they're going to be living outside the kingdom. Further study will show that the, uh, the order of these resurrections. It's critical for us to understand these orders because we, we need to be in the first resurrection. I mean, there's no way, no error, if we focus on being the bride. So we have a resurrection by prophecy, and I submit to you that now we're going to see a, revelation, a, a, a resurrection by revelation that comes only through the Word, Yahshua. In John chapter 11, yeah, we're going to use the New Testament to do this. John chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. Joshua said to her, he's talking to Martha here, her brother had died, Lazarus. She said, man, if you had just been here, you wouldn't have died. Look what he says. Joshua said to her, your brother shall rise again. That's that kum, kumi I was telling you about in the Hebrew. And that's, that means resurrection. Come up from the dead. Martha said to him, I know these are key words that this woman spoke. We always focus on what Joshua was saying. But look at what his disciples said. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So they understood as common people in, in Israel that there was a resurrection and it was going to take place on the last day. Remember the feast that we celebrate on the last day? The last great day? They knew by celebrating the feast the order of when they were going to be resurrected. But Yahshua says, oh, but if you believe in me, there's another resurrection. Yahshua said to her, I am a Yah in Hebrew. Oh, Yahweh said the same thing. You tell them that a Yah, I am, has sent you. And here Yahshua says the same words of the Father. A Yah, life. The resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And everyone that is living and believing in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this? So here we have a woman that had been taught that there is a resurrection of the dead. And she understood that they would rise again at the last day. This has got everything to do with the feast, the moiety that we just learned about when we started here. But Yahshua said, no, you'll live again in me. I am the resurrection. He's showing her another resurrection. What did he do right after these words? A disciple that believed in him that died, he brought forth from the grave. And he was showing them, you guys that believe in me, and have received me, the word, will be in a separate resurrection apart from those who haven't. If you believe in the Messiah, and you are following the Torah precepts, you are the bride. You are those who are his at his coming. And it's a total different resurrection as we're going to see. He said, do you believe this? She confesses. Yeah, Master, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of Elohim, who's coming into the world. 
Then he raises Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead. He's showing them that you who believe in me are going to be resurrected apart from those people who are resurrected at the end. So now let's go through the orders of the resurrection. Shaul teaches on the resurrection that Yahshua reveals to those who believe who have believed on him. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 29, very critical that we understand Shaul's writings here. A lot of people call him a heretic, and I call him one of the most gifted Torah teachers that ever walked the earth uh, when Yahshua did. If you can't understand the Torah and the, and the ancient biblical Hebrew that he understood, you're going to want to exclude his writings from your doctrine and theories. Because he was laced with the word, which gives life, by the way. If in this life only we have expectation in Messiah, see what he's saying? If, if we, those who believe in the Messiah, are the only ones who have that expectation of resurrection, then the world is going to hate us. We are of all men the most wretched. He's telling the assembly in Corinth, we're not the only ones that have this expectation. My brethren do too. We are of all men the most wretched, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead and has come, has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For as all die in Adam, so also shall all be made alive in Messiah. And each in his own what? There's an order to the resurrections. Each one in its order. Messiah was the first fruit. That's not the harvest of first fruits. That is the wave sheaf offering. He was our wave sheaf offering. But the harvest doesn't come until the second set of feasts. He was the first fruit. Then those who are of Messiah when they die. At his coming. The other resurrection is a resurrection at the end of the thousand year millennial reign. This resurrection is those when he returns. At his coming, then the end. See that? After his first coming, at the end of the thousand years, then the end's going to come. And at that point, everybody who was left over in the nations has been ministered to, has accepted Yahshua the word, and accepted the Torah principles, and come into Sukkot, as the prophets say, in order to be in the kingdom reign. When he delivers up the reign to Elohim the Father, when he has brought to naught all rule and all authority and power, for he has to reign until, that's during the thousand years that he's here, he has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to naught is death. So at the end of the thousand year millennial reign, we're going to see that's when the second resurrection happens as well. All of those people that have not accepted the truth are going to be thrown into the lake of fire with the uh, false prophet and the beast that are already there. Then Satan and the last one going into that pit is death. At that point, that's when there's no more opportunities. Yahweh has given us so many opportunities to repent, receive the truth, and come into the land because he wants all of us to be saved. You don't just die and it's over. He has given us opportunity to come into this kingdom. He doesn't want any of us to perish. Now look at verse 29. We immersed Brother Walter last night in Grainfield. The way all that went, to, went about was I called and was talking to him on the phone. He said they were still a few miles out. And I said, well, where are you guys going to be staying? He said, the Super 8. And I told my mother. And she goes, oh, well, there's a hot tub and a swimming pool in, indoor there. And I remember he had told me he hadn't been immersed in Yahshua's name yet. Immediately I went, ding. So I called him back and I said, hey, brother, uh, did you bring any shorts? And he's like, I don't know. I 
my wife packed my bag. <laughs> well, I had an extra pair. Anyway, he said, well, I was thinking about getting immersed whenever we opened the building. I said, don't put this off any longer. Everybody in this room needs to understand the significance of being immersed in the right name. And that's biblical. When Paul came to Ephesus, he was speaking to some believers, and he said, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, What are you talking about? We never have heard of any Holy Spirit. And he says, Well, unto, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. And he goes, oh, well, indeed, John baptized with the repentance and remission of sin. But now you need to be baptized in the name of Yahshua for the remission of your sin. He said, oh, that baptism, now that I'm giving you this information, is no longer valid. So we need to get, and they immediately said, hey, yeah, well, then give it to me. Here's why. This is what they used to teach. Now remember, this has got something to do with the resurrection and the truth. He's talking about resurrection here. Look what he says in verse 29. Otherwise, what shall they do who are immersed for the what? Dead. Dry bones. In the valley. Your immersion is for what? Your dead body. When you repent and you believe on Yahshua... You have a new life. What do you do with a dead body, people? You bury it. The Bible says you're buried with him in baptism and risen again with him in new life. Otherwise, what shall we, what shall they do who are immersed for the dead if the dead are not raised? He is saying that your baptism has something to do with you being resurrected in the first resurrection. How important does that make you or make baptism in Yahshua's name sound to you now? When it's just something that, that we as an assembly of people have said, oh yeah, you know what, I need to get baptized. You don't know how much you need. It's a lot more than an outward sign of an inward cleansing and all of this false doctrine that we've received. It's got a lot more than a, 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 an outward sign of your faith in Messiah. No. It's got something to, something to do with your death, burial, and resurrection in the Messiah. The apostle said that, not me. If the dead do not raise at all, why indeed are they immersed for the dead? See, the people who have received the washing of the water by the word and believed on Yahshua and been immersed in his name now are eligible for the first resurrection that he preached to Martha and all of those people on that day. He is loving and he is making, uh, not only giving us an opportunity of life from the dead, but to partake in the first resurrection. The last will be first and the first will be last. The first people that he called out was Israel and they're going to be last at the end of the thousand year millennial reign. And we have seen the things that they wish to see and we are partaking in their inheritance. And all he asks is that we believe in his word. The blood of his son and to be immersed in that name so that our sins can be washed away. We, we need that. So that's why I was so adamant last night. Before they unpacked a bag, before they got to eat, before anything, Brother Larry and I ran down there and we immersed him in the name of Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now moving on. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. Now we see that this is that teaching is definitely connected to the resurrections. And this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim. That's where we started off a while ago. Now we're going to get a little bit deeper into his prophecy here, or, or the fulfilling of the prophecy he's showing us. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. See, I speak a secret to you. See this corruption inherit incorruption? The reason why Yahshua got a glorified body is because he condemned sin in the flesh. 
That's written in the book of Romans. Everybody who wants to receive that body must condemn sin in the flesh before they go into the kingdom. So those people in the second resurrection had not condemned sin in the flesh, and the only way that we can condemn sin in the flesh is to receive Yahshua, the word, the water. I speak a mystery, a secret to you. See, not everybody who knew the Torah had this revelation that we have had. Not everybody knew it. I am revealing a secret to you, this first resurrection. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. He's giving us biblical principles here, you guys. When a man and a woman say their vows, they perform ketubah, what happens to the flesh? The two shall become one flesh. If Yahshua has re received a glorified body, and we know that he dwells in a beautiful body now, one that is incorruptible. And if we are his bride and his coming in the first resurrection, and we are joined to him in marriage, then we have it just like his. The first resurrection is going to be the bride, and we are going to have the same exact body that he has. Because we're his bride. And we become one flesh. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. You can read about these trumpet blasts, and it is connected to the feasts in the Bible once again. But this last trumpet is one of seven trumpets that are sounded in the book of Revelation. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That's the first resurrection. And we shall be changed. Why the change? Because the two have become one flesh. Yahshua's bride. But yet we know in prophecy that there's another resurrection that happens in the flesh. Verse 53. For this corruptible has to put on incorruption, and this mortal to put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to be the word that has been written in the prophecies, death is swallowed up in overcoming or victory. So we have learned in this chapter that Shaul continues to reveal the mystery of the first resurrection. He also sheds light on when Yahshua's return will be at the last trump. And if you well, we'll get into that in a moment. Scripture says, is at the last trumpet, which also has everything to do with Yahweh's appointed times or feasts. The trumpet blasts bring to pass certain groups of prophecies. Revelation, chapter 8, 1 through 4. And when he opened the seventh seal, who's bringing to pass the prophecies? Yahshua. He's been given, the, uh, they see a, a, a lamb as it had been slain, and all of a sudden he goes up and he takes the scroll from him who sits on the throne, and it's sealed with these seals that Daniel couldn't open, nobody else could open, only Yahshua could open the seals and bring the prophecies to pass. And he opened the seventh seal, there came to be silence in the heaven for about half an hour. Now, when I read this, I got kind of tickled. I was like, oh, I remember my stepdad. All of a sudden, I had four stepbrothers. And whenever he got angry, we'd just go in the front room and we'd be like, we were just quiet as a church house mouse. You know, because we knew, as soon as my mom got through telling him, you know, what, what had been going on, that there was going to be some problems. That's what's going on here. All of the angels are, are, are the mouth, and, and they're going to be standing at attention, and they're ready to receive the command to carry out the prophecy. It's going to be quiet. Ooh, they are in trouble. <laughs> that's, what, that's why I believe that it's going to be quiet. There's a moment of silence for about what is fixing to happen. 
And I saw the seven messengers who stand before Elohim. See, and that, in many versions, we see uh, seven spirits. Mm -mm. It's messengers that stand before him. Yahweh doesn't have seven spirits. He has seven messengers that pour out the bowls and blow the trumpets. There's seven bowls and seven trumpets and seven messengers that carry out his work. Who stand before Elohim, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another messenger came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the set-apart ones upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the set-apart ones, went up before Elohim from the hand of the messenger. So here we see the, the uh, implement of the, of the trumpets spoken of by Shaul. Revelations uh, 11, 15 through 18. And the seven messengers sounded. This is when he's coming back. And there came to be loud voices in the heaven saying, The reign of this world has become the reign of our master. Here he comes. Seventh trump. And of his Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. Where is he going? The reign of the world has become the reign of the master. We're not going there. He's coming here. See what the kingdom reign is? He put Adam on this earth for a reason. He said, be fruitful here and multiply. That plan's going to get carried out. He didn't scratch the pad and start off with a new blueprint. He said, Satan, all of his messengers, anybody, any weapon formed against my people is not going to prosper, and the plan that I instituted in the beginning will be carried out. It's mine, he says. I made it. I will save it. I will save my people, and there's nothing you can do about it, and I'll go back to the plan in the beginning, and it will be even more fruitful. He turns losing situations into huge gains. And that reign that they take over here in this world will be forever and ever. That would be the Hebrew word olam. Forever. And the 24 elders sitting before him, Elohim on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped him saying, We give you thanks, O El Shaddai, the one who is and who was and who is, to, and who is coming, because you have taken your great power and reigned. And the nations were enraged. And your wrath has come, and the time of the dead to be judged. See, now at the end of the thousand years, we have the dead that are going to be raised. And at that time, all of the dry bones of Israel are going to receive the revelation that the Mashiach is there, and they're going to come into the fold and be re-engrafted back into the tree, just like Romans tells us. And that word judged is the Greek word 2919. Uh, I heard a lot of people say that that concept can't be true, My, the concept I'm trying to show you guys here, that it can't be true that there was going to be people coming into the fold at this time because it's the end judgment. But that English word can be very deceiving. To be judged, that word judged in English is the Greek word number 2919, and it means to make a decision. It doesn't mean that somebody's going to be condemned in judgment. It says that the time of decision has come. When they are all risen, our families that have died not knowing Yahshua are going to be given an opportunity to come in and dwell with us. Hallelujah. He doesn't want us to be sad by death, sickness, disease. He's given every ample situation. He's done everything possible. And at every stage of our life, he has opened a door for us to, even in death, he's opened a door for us to reign with him. I know so many people that I want to go run into on that day. Because I love them. And a lot of them are unbelievers. They don't even, they believe in nothing. But they're good people. And because of the teachings of this world, they say, it's garbage. I don't believe a word of it. And it's those people that we need to go after. Our family that didn't believe, 
those who did believe and didn't have it right will have the opportunity to go out and, and help them understand, to bring them into the fold. Will help them make that decision and to give the reward to your servants, Israel. When they rise in the second resurrection, they're going to be given the opportunity to receive their reward, which is the kingdom. He promised it to them. The promise has been made to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're just getting in where we fit in if we're not actually an Israelite. And those who fear your name, mm, that's a big one. His name. Small and great, and to destroy those who have destroyed the earth. To destroy the earth is to remove the Torah from it and not live according to what he said to live by. You destroy the earth. There's death all around us. Proof's in the pudding. Foretold, that is foretold in prophecy. Let's go to the uh, book of Numbers. Chapter 10. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now. We're going to see that Yahshua teaches the same message that we're about to receive right now. Verses 1 through 10 in Bimidbar, or Numbers chapter 10. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, make two silver what? Trumpets. So here's a prelude to what we're reading about uh, uh, Shaul teaching and Yohanan in the book of Revelation. Make two silver trumpets for yourself and take, make them of beaten work. Yahshua was beaten. And what is these trumpet sounds going to usher in? Yahshua's return. And you shall use them for calling the congregation and for breaking camp. What is going to happen whenever he comes back for his bride? We're breaking camp. We're moving. Where? To the land. This prophecy is a prelude of what happens when Yahshua comes back. The trumpet is sounded and the camp, or the people of Israel break camp. Verse 3. And when they blow both of them, all the congregation shall meet before you at the door of the tent of meeting. And if they blow one, the leaders and the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather you, or gather to you. And when you blow a shout, the, these are different pitches of the trumpets, by the way. Uh, the camp that lie on the east side shall depart, and when you blow a shout the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall depart. They blow a shout for them to depart. And that's what we're going to do when Yahshua returns and these trumpet blasts are going off. We're pulling up stakes and we're moving. We are departing. We're moving the camp. Verse 7, and when the assembly is to be assembled, you blow, but do not shout. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, blow with, blow with the trumpets, and it shall be to you for a law forever throughout your generations. And when you go into battle, what's going to be happening at that time? Yahweh is going to be doing battle with the armies of the world. We just read that. against the enemies that distress you, talking about during the tribulation period here, then you shall shout with the trumpets, and you shall re be remembered before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall be saved from your enemies. That's what this whole thing started out with, is him wanting to save his people. Verse 10, And in the day of your gladness, and in your appointed times, there's the Moedim again, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpet, or the trumpets, 
over your burnt offerings and over the peace offerings, and they shall be remembered. There shall be a remembrance for you before Elohim. I, Yah, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. It's the same exact thing that we just read in the other prophecies written in the law. Now, Yahshua teaches these, this same message. Matthew 24, 20 through 25. And I pray that your and pray that your flight is not does not take place in the winter or what? On the Sabbath. So in the end times, clearly he was saying that his people would still be celebrating the seventh day Sabbath. For then there shall be great distress. What did we just read in the prophecy? About the distresses. Such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no more, nor ever shall be. And if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones. Wait a minute. That makes sense. The second, excuse me, the second resurrection is a resurrection in the flesh, right? And people are dying when he comes back the uh, second time. And here it says, but for the chain, no flesh shall be saved. Oh, yes, it will in the second resurrection. That's what he's telling us. But for the sake of the chosen ones, those days shall be shortened. So the tribulation time would have been a lot longer had it not been for his love for the brethren. Verse 23, if anyone then says to you, look, here's the Messiah. People, please stop watching all of these guys with these timelines. Seriously. Look what he says. If somebody is saying, look, here's the Messiah, and that's what's, oh, he's coming back this year. We've got it, we've done it, we've got it mathematically figured out. Okay. Here's the Messiah. Or there, he says, do not believe him. Don't you believe a word of it. For false messiahs, we've identified those in the past here. No need to rehashing that. And false prophets, those who are speaking words that Yahweh never said for them to speak, shall arise, <clears throat> and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. See, I have forewarned you. Yahshua said, don't you believe it when they say I'm coming. Nobody knows. All we have to know is that we need to be prepared during the fall feast. That's when he's coming back. Don't try to figure out the year. Don't try to figure out the day because we can't do it. And when it happens, if we are ready and prepared and have cleansed ourselves like the Torah says to do during the fall feast, then we will be ready. We're told by Messiah Yahshua himself not to get caught up with people saying he's going to be here or there at such and such a time, etc. And he himself tells us that believers will be here during the tribulation period. Looking further at Yahshua's words, here's the timeline that we need to be looking at, you guys. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines to the west. That's the timeline he gave us. <laughs> It's going to be that quick. We're not going to have the chance to write a book about it and make a million or prophesy a false prophecy and say, hey, everybody is coming this year and make a million and it not happen. It's going to happen in a way that no one will be able to take credit for it but him. So shall the coming of the son of Adam be. For wherever the dead body is, now remember, the dead body, there the eagles shall be gathered together. He's talking about the armies of the world gathering to do battle against him. And what did he say the dead, dead bodies are? In the nation. He's talking about the second resurrection. The dry bones, the dead bodies of Israel are still out here in the nations. And that's where all of the armies of the world, these, these uh, These eagles that he's speaking about here, these vultures, that's another word that can, you can translate there as eagle too. Um, they shall be gathered there. And immediately after the tribulation, after the distress, 
of those days the sun shall be darkened, and the moon not give its light, and the stars fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then, at the end of the tribulation, the sign of, of the son of Adam shall appear in the heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Adam coming in the clouds of heaven with power and much esteem. And he shall send his messengers with the great sound of a... That's when he's coming back. At the last trumpet that is sound in the book of Revelation, he himself says, that's when I'm coming back. So it's got something to do with the fall feasts, trumpets, tabernacles, so on and so forth. And they shall gather together his chosen ones. It's talking about my bride here, those in the first resurrection. From the four winds, from the one end of the heaven and to the other. Now, this is what, when he gathers us, he also tells us in the book of Revelation where we're going. Revelation chapter 5. Verses 7 through 10. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the set-apart ones. And they sang a renewed song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll... To open the seals, remember, when each seal is broken, we have bowls being poured out, we have trumpets being blasted. Because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood, out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation, and made us sovereigns and priests to our Elohim, and we shall reign upon the earth. That's where we're going. We're going to sit up the millennial reign here. Isn't this the re revelation of Yahshua Messiah? And he's giving it to one of his disciples. Yahshua says that he is coming back and we're going to set up the millennial reign here on this earth. Now, this is also uh, a carrying over of the prophecy of Zechariah in Zechariah 14. Verses 7 through 10. Excuse me. 12 through 18. And this is the plague of which Yahweh plagues us, plagues the people. Now remember, these are when the bowls are being poured out, this is when the trumpets are being sounded, and here's the same prophecy by Zechariah. And this is the plague with which Yahweh plagues the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall decay while they stand on their feet, and their eyes decay in their sockets, and their tongues decay in their mouths. And it shall be in that day that a great confusion from Yahweh is among them, and every one of them shall seize the land of his neighbor, and his, and his hand rise up against his neighbor's hand. And Yehudah shall fight at Jerusalem, And the wealth of all the Gentiles around, round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and garments in great quantities. And so the plague of the, ha of the horse and the mule on the camel and the donkey and all the cattle that are in the, those camps as this plague. And it shall be that all who are left from the Gentiles... Bringing them in, which came up against Jerusalem, shall go from go up from year to year to bow themselves to the sovereign Yahweh of hosts and observe the festival of booths. So during the thousand-year millennial reign, the bride, the people in the first resurrection, that is their job to go into the nation, minister to the people, and bring them into the kingdom. But here's what happens to those who will not come in and Sukkot. 
Verse 17. And it shall be that if any one of the clans of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to bow himself <clears throat> to the sovereign Yahweh of hosts, on them there is to be no rain. Dry bones. And if the clan of Mitzrayim, and remember Mitzrayim at this point was a, a, a sign of the world, does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague with which Yahweh plagues the Gentiles who do not come up to observe uh, the feast, the festival of booths. So this is our job during the thousand year millennial reign, is to go out and minister to these people and bring them into Sukkot with us. And that goes in line perfectly with everything that we've read from the other prophets and Yahshua himself. So here's what is preached in uh, Revelation. Revelation 21, 6 through 8. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Tall, the beginning and the end. The one who thirsts, I shall give of the fountain of the water of life without payment. That water. The one who overcomes shall inherit all of this, and I shall be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the untrustworthy, and the abominable, and murderers, and those who whore, and drug sorcerers, and idolaters, and the false, their part is in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the what? Second death. So according to this, people who are unfaithful and untrustworthy in the covenant, those who do what things are abominable in the Torah, will still be considered abominable in the end. So all of these types of people shall not inherit the kingdom, but in the end, if they do not receive our witness come up to tabernacle with us in the, in the millennial reign, then that's where they go in the end. What leads up to this? It is critical for us to understand when all of this happens. The order of the resurrections and why we need to be a part of the bride in the first resurrection that we may secure our destiny now. Revelation chapter 20. Now remember, our doctrine has to, I mean, from cover to cover, we must see the same exact teaching about the resurrection from the dead. Or we have a huge problem. Nobody's going to know how to get there. Revelation chapter 20. We'll begin at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them... And judgment was given to them, and the lives of those who had been beheaded because of the witness they bore to Yahshua, and because of the word of Elohim, and who did not worship the beast, nor his image, and did not receive his mark. All of those things that we just read about, about uh, the abominable, and all that. Now we're seeing the other side of the picture here, those who weren't doing those things. Uh, or upon their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah for what? A thousand years. So the people in the first resurrection are going to be those who have died with the testimony. And those who have confessed in Yahshua already. We're going to live with him for a thousand years. Verse 5. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years we're in. It's two resurrections. What we've learned is that if we confess on Yahshua now, if we're baptized into his name, if we're baptized for the dead and risen again with him in new life, and we prepare ourselves with the Torah and the belief in the true Messiah now, then we are bride material. Those who will come to life when Yahshua returns. Now, it's critical for us to try to be this in this resurrection, as we're going to see. The rest of the dead don't live until the end of the thousand years. So that's different from the resurrection of the wicked. 
Exactly. And what this is showing us, that's a good point. What this is showing us is there's going to be wicked resurrected with the nation of Israel. It's all going to be, and the rest of the dead, everyone will be resurrected, but Israel's already going to know what to do. They already know the Torah, and they're waiting on the Mashiach. And they're going to go, there's our calling, but they thought that they were going to be first, but they were actually last. The first will be last, and the last will be first. We were drafted in. The last were drafted in, and were coming into the kingdom before them, and they didn't think it would work out that way. Remember the parable of Yahshua. We had some laborers that went in the beginning. And they had some laborers that went in towards the end of the day. And he gave those at the end of the day that went in the same wages. You see this? He's talking about the resurrections there. We came in late in the game. They're, we're going to be resurrected before a lot of them. And we're still receiving the same reward. Eternal life in the kingdom. With a different body. He has shown us so much mercy. And he has given us so many opportunities. It's just. But it's, it's critical for you guys to understand what you need to do. If you're, if you're on this earth when he comes. If you're sitting in here today. Or there's people all over the world that are sitting in and celebrating this Shabbat. Have been immersed in, in Yahshua's name. They have prepared themselves as the bride. You are a specific, special group of people. Hallelujah. He loves us. He was even willing to cut off part of the original tree in order to get us in the picture. And then he gave us an inheritance that is going to be beyond comprehension. So it's very, very important for us to understand how to get into the first resurrection. Let's continue reading. This will tell us why. Blessed and set apart in verse 6. Blessed and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death that we just read about has no authority over them. That's why. That's why it is important for us to understand which resurrection happens when and which one we need to be in in order to conquer death. If we're his bride in the first resurrection, we're going to get the same type of body that he has when he comes, and it is immortal. It can never see death. You notice that it doesn't say that about the people in the second resurrection? It says... That the second death has no power over them who partake of the first resurrection. It doesn't say that about the people in the second. Why? Because at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released again. To deceive the nations. And you think he's mad now? And deceiving us now? If we don't have this knowledge, and we don't live by this <coughs> wisdom that he's given us, there is a chance in the second resurrection that you can lose your life. Verse 7, and when the thousand years ended, Satan shall be released from his prison, and he shall go out to the land the nations, uh, to lead the uh, nations astray, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle. See, there's still going to be people at the, thousand year, at the end of the thousand years that just said, I am not doing any of that. I don't believe it going to gather the nations of the world come up to fight against us. So look at verse 10. And the devil who led them astray was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tortured day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him who was sitting on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne. And what? 
books were open. Now, if we had already been written in the book and we partook of the first resurrection, or you died and went to heaven or hell right when if you if you went to heaven or hell right when you died, then why would the books have to be opened again? He's opening the books, which is the Torah, the Law and the Prophets, and the Book of Life, the Book of Remembrance, because more names are going to be added to it on this day. And if your name is not found in that book at the end of the day, you know where you're going. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to their works. He's going to look at your life. He's going to say, all right, my Torah says to do this. Did you ever do it? Have you listened to my messengers that I've sent out there for this thousand years? Didn't listen to them either. So they're being judged according to their works then. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And the death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. That's when it's all over. And if any, anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. critical for us to understand how important it is for us to be involved in the first resurrection, which means we need to line ourselves up to be part of the bride at Yahshua's coming, and I believe everyone in this room has taken that step. But it says also when we started out this study that we, there needs to be prayer and intercession made for those who aren't. The Hebrew word for arise, Strong's Hebrew number 6965. Get your little sheet out there. This is the Hebrew word for resurrection. Kum. To rise. So I've been used in various applications. Um, in the ancient Hebrew lexicon, it's number 1427J, subsection V. And here we see Kuf Wa Mem. Now let's look at the pictures here. This has to do with resurrection, according to Hebrew thought. And this is what this is always pictured to the Hebrew people. So first we see the, uh, the Kuf there, which is the fourth one up from the bottom on your right hand side. You see it in a different form there. It's the sun on the horizon. To condense, circle, time. Here we see the wa. And the wa is one, two, three, four, five, the sixth one down. on the left-hand column, and it's a tent peg. And I submit to you that this is how Yahweh is keeping the, the tent together. It's by the stake, by the peg. It holds down the corners of the tent that the winds can't blow it away, that the, the foundation of the household is secured. And he's showing us something here. The mem, which is the second one up from the bottom on the left-hand side, look at what it pictures. Water. We have dry bones that had to have water. The woman at the well that had to have the water. And we have Shaul teaching that water baptism has something to do with you rising. And I'll be darned, look. What does this Hebrew mean wise? Uh, word mean? Resurrection. Rising. Look what, look what is pictured here. The sun on the horizon, look at the wall, what it can mean over here. It can mean to secure. How? This can also mean blood. 
The son would secure the house by his blood. And it's got to do with rising. The Hebrew people always knew this concept. Paul knew this concept. We need to understand this concept. There was going to be somebody, the sun on the horizon, when he came, he would secure the house, the tent, with his blood. And it would allow us to rise in the resurrection. This is why we've seen them in prophecy going, our expectation has went past us. What happened? Because they thought Mashiach was going to come while they were alive. And he was going to deliver just Israel that was in the land then. But the first was last. And now the last became first. This ancient Hebrew word means to raise. To raise or rise up. Also in the sense of continuing or establishing something. And I submit to you it is the... Continuing and establishing of Yahweh's kingdom reign on the earth. And the root word of this, this is how you do etymology, study back a little bit further. The root of this word is the kuf and the mem. It also means concretely a stalk. Here's the English definition of stalk. A plant stem. Remember he removed a vine out of Egypt. Branches, a stalk removed from the tree. A rising or standing of anything. Those broken branches rising again. Be made to stand. In Messiah, we will stand. We're going to live. In summary, we have learned from Scripture that the study of the Hebrew, along with the words of Messiah himself, that there is more than one resurrection along with seeing when each resurrection will take place. We need to prepare ourselves now to escape this fiery pit that will destroy anything and anyone in opposition to Yahweh and his kingdom at the end of the thousand year reign. But we have also learned that all the dead have a chance to repent and come to Sukkot with us in Yahweh's dwelling. And this brings us comfort. I remember when my mom received this revelation that you didn't just die and go to heaven or hell. She was in tears. I said, what's wrong, mom? It made me cry. It makes me cry now. But I, she was, uh, I said, why are you so upset? And she said, no, it, it's not that I'm upset, I'm happy. Because now that I came into to the knowledge that I have now, she began to think of her aunts, her uncles, other people, her sisters, that didn't die knowing this. And this brings us comfort to know that Yahweh has a plan for everyone, the living and the dead, hallelujah, to come into his kingdom. The doctrine of heaven and hell and you going to heaven or hell when you die is a scare tactic of the church to keep you putting money in their plate. Away with their money. We don't need it. We need this wisdom. We need to know what to do, how to prepare ourselves as the bride, so that when he comes, we can stand before him in boldness and humility and say, I have waited for you so long. Now let's go out and save those other people. I want to be part of it. And it's got to be in our hearts to want other people to have this type of deliverance as we go out into the nations that are outside the millennial reign and plead with them to please accept our Messiah so that they can live. It's a comforting thing to know that we know people that we love very much that died and we thought that they were hopeless now and they're not. That's the type of Elohim we serve. He gives us hope and expectation that not only ourselves, but our loved ones and others that have not had the opportunity to know him, 
in the end, they'll have the chance. That is comforting to know that he loves us that much. It doesn't make him look like some big ogre ready to just send you to heaven or hell. These are the closing verses. Now we can better understand what Paul was talking about here. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. This brings us comfort now that we know the order of the resurrections. Now, brothers, we do not wish you to be ignorant. See, there was a lot of ignorance going on in the assemblies. There's a lot of ignorance going on in the churches today, too. That doesn't mean that we don't dislike them or, or, or we, we need to excuse me, intercede for them. We need to pray for them. Okay? He doesn't, but they, Yahweh doesn't want us to be ignorant of these facts. He needs us to know this information because we're going to work for him in his kingdom. We need to know about the priesthood. We need to know what to do. We need to know what not to do, definitely, in the kingdom. We do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest you be sad as others who have no expectation. The sadness that my mother felt. The sadness that others in this room today may have felt when you had a loved one that died and you just thought, oh, you know what? He's never going to make it. Yeah, you will. Yes, he will. Lest you be sad as others who have no expectation. There's that expectation. That word again has to do with cord and hope. Expectation, cord, and and biblical cord, the expectation of the bride producing seed, birth, in the first or second resurrection. For if we believe that Yahshua died and rose again, so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yahshua. For this we say to you by the word of the Master, that we, the living, who are left over at the coming of the Master, shall in no way go before those who are asleep. Because the Master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of a chief messenger, and there it is again, and with the trumpet of Elohim, the seventh trumpet. And the dead in Messiah shall rise first. See that? The people who believed in Messiah... And we started following the commandments and were part of the disciples, they're going to be risen first. Then we, if we if this happens now, if we were in this room right now, we would see graves open all over the place, and those who died believing in Yahshua before us, we would watch them go up to meet Yahshua in the clouds. And everybody get ready because we're next. Get your Saturday go to meetings on. Brush your teeth, comb your hair. It's time to present yourself to the king. Then we, the living who are left over, shall be caught away together with them in the clouds. And then we're going to set up the millennial reign to meet the master in the air. And so we shall always be with the master. Look, so then encourage, comfort, comfort one another. With these words. See it's a comforting thing. To come to this knowledge. It's a comforting thing to know. That there are loved ones that we may have lost. That aren't condemned to Gehenna. That they do have an opportunity. To come into the body. And to live with us forever in the kingdom. Thank Yahweh today for these resurrections. Thank him for the blood of his son. That made it happen. We need to thank Yahweh for each other. Because we're here together preparing ourselves for this. And there's comfort in knowing about these resurrections. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you once again for your Shabbat. Father, we just lift everything up to you and pray that everything that we've went over today would edify you, your kingdom, and the body of Messiah. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we thank you so much, Father for the inheritance that you have prepared for your people. We pray blessings, Father, upon everyone here. And we give you thanksgiving.
pray this in the name of Yahshua. Amen. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's a, terrible. That's a tight shot of Larry. That's not good. The glare is going to get you. Yep. <laughs>